Good morning. Welcome to mobile application program of Ashram IS Academy. Today, in the present session, I'm going to introduce Unit 7 of Philosophy, that is known as Philosophy of Religion, Part 1. It covers topics starting with attributes of God, and it will end with revelation and faith. Now, this topic is important for the reason that this forms important part of philosophy option. Now to begin with attributes of God and the relation between God and man. Now to begin with attributes of God. What does it mean to say that God is omnipresent? God is omnipresent because he makes his work everywhere failed. You see the meaning? To call God omnipresent. God is omnipotent because he has the power to actualize his will and desire because he sustains whole realm of mundane existence. God is Omniscient, because he had universal experience. He knows events of past, present, and future. Then God is called infinite, in the sense that he is perfect, complete, and self-sufficient. Then God is called eternal, because he is ever time and a space, then God is a good in the sense of it being intrinsic good. Then the nature of God is a theistic one. But besides this, God is also just. God is just in the sense that he determines the proportion of reward and punishment to men on the deeds they perform if the actions of men are right then they are rewarded and if actions of men are wrong then they are punished. Now, this God is theistic God. And being theistic, God has some important elements. Number one, God had a reason to think because God becomes a personal God. And second, God can take his free decision. And third, God must come in some form. As you see, that God comes in the form of human being or even in the form of sometimes animals. According to Christianity, the relation between God is that of the relation between father and son. Now, next comes arguments to prove the existence of God. And the first is ontological argument. The ontological argument proves the existence of God on the basis of the idea of God. And Salem has given the argument to prove the existence of God. His argument runs as under. God is a being than which a greater cannot be conceived. But, but an idea which existed only in intellectual is not as great as 
the idea which existed in both intellectual in intellectual as well as in reality. So, since God is the greatest being, so definitely He will exist in reality. Now, Descartes is the second philosopher who has given the ontological argument to prove the existence of God. Descartes argued that every human being had the idea of a perfect being. But this idea can be the idea of a perfect being only when the being of which we have an idea exists. Because existence is a quality of perfection. Then comes Spinoza. He argued that man's ideas come not from himself, but it must have some external source. So if a man had the idea of God, then God must have just before his thought because he becomes the source of this idea that we do have. Leibniz argued that there is a reality in essence or possibility. And if something is in essence or possibility, then he must also exist. The reason? The reason is that essence implies existence. But to be possible is to be actual. So on this argument, Leibniz proves the existence of God, and this is his ontological argument. Next comes Malcolm. Malcolm argues that God is conceived to be an unlimited being. And if God is designed to be an unlimited being, he must be created to be infinite regarding his existence and operation. So, God exists. Now, the second kind of argument is cosmological argument. Cosmological argument is based on the causal principle. Causal principle holds that every event has a cause. Since the world is an event, so it must have a cause. And the cause of this world is none but God. So God exists. Thomas Aquinas has proved the existence of God on the basis of the contingent nature of things of the world. Things of the world may or may not exist. This is the meaning of being contingent. Now, how can we explain this contingent nature of things and beings of the world? This can be explained only when we accept some such reality which is necessary. Because it is in terms of necessary or in the reference to necessary that we can explain things which are contingent and probable. Now, we find that it is this way that even Thomas Aquinas proves the existence of God. Then comes causal and theological arguments. Causal argument again is based on causal principle which holds that every event must have a cause. But this argument runs as follows. There are things which have causes and those causes also have another causes. If those causes again have some another causes, but the ultimate cause of it and everything of the world is none but perfection. And since that prakriti, or we can say 
that God who becomes the first cause because we cannot ask the question of what is the cause of God. So it is this way that the existence of God is proved. That is the first cause of things and things of the world. Now, next comes the logical argument. This argument uh, proves the existence of God eh, on the basis of design and system which are found in things and beings of the world. You find that plants grow, then leaves come out, then flowers come, and then fruits come, not conversely. So this speaks of the design of things and beings of the world. But the question is that where from this design comes? This implies that there must be some most intelligent designer who has designed them. And this designer is God. So God exists. This is known as theological argument. The highest moral ideal according to Kant, is to become entirely rational. But Kant argued that since the present life is short, this ideal of being fully rational cannot be achieved. So this can be achieved only in the next life. But for that, we will have to accept that we are immortal or our soul is immortal. So on this basis, Kant also claims to prove the idea of that God. In the sense that he said that when in the next life, we attain full rationality, then at the same time we also have the happiness. Question is, what is the cause of happiness? Rationality cannot be the cause of happiness because these two are opposites. Happiness is a feeling. So, the cause of this happiness that a man gets after being fully rational is none but God. So Kant said that it is this way that the existence of God can be proved. Then next topic comes the idea of immortality. That desire to survive even after death in any form take the idea of immortality. The idea of immortality has been an even haunting desire for entire humanity, from savage to the seven, from the pauper to the prince. Immortality is proven to be on the basis of conservation of energy. But it, this principle of the conservation of energy, it is scientific principle. This principle holds that energy is not destroyed. Now, it is argued that soul is an energy. And being energy, soul is also not destroyed. It exists. So soul is immortal. Now, the second argument is given on the basis of revelation. What is this revelation? It is argued that our mind, our intellect, our thinking moves long distance. Even our body is here. I'm here but my mind can move thousand and thousand kilometers away. So, 
that is one element of our existence which can move with leaving our body here. So it is argued that why not soul? Soul can also leave the body and move in some other body. And so on this basis, we can say that the soul is immortal. Plato argued and proves the idea of immortality on the ground. Plato said that the soul is simple. And what is simple cannot be decomposed or analyzed into parts. As a result, that cannot die, that cannot be destroyed. So the soul is immortal. Plato points out, he gives another argument that we all do have some such ideas in our mind. The cause of which is not known to us. We try to find the cause of these ideas, but we do not find the cause of these ideas in the present life. But there must be some cause of these ideas. And if the cause is not in the present life, then it must be in the past life. But this we can accept only when we accept that the soul is immortal. Because from the past life, soul enters into the present life. So it is in this way that also Plato proves the idea of immortality. Now, next comes eh, this Kant. He argued, as we have said, how does he prove the existence of God? So, again, that argument applies to, the, to prove the idea of immortality. That every human being has the moral ideal to become fully, fully rational. But this ideal cannot be achieved in the present life because our life is very short. So for that, we have to just realize this in the next life. And for that, we will have to be accepted that soul is immortal. So it is on this basis that the idea of immortality had been proved and established by different philosophers. Now come, see the idea of moksha. Moksha, that is liberation, means freedom from pains and sufferings of life. Freedom from rebirth and freedom from sunshine. This is the very simple meaning of the word moksha. Now, according to Sankhya Yoga, the word moksha means kaivalya, which means the realization of Purusha, the principle of consciousness. Every one of us is having that original Purusha in us, say Sankhya. And in the state of moksha, we realize, I get identified with that eh, pure conscious purush. This is the state of eh, our moksha. So, this is the idea given by Sankhya Yoga philosophy. Then, according to Advaita Vedanta, moksha means the complete identity between the self and Brahma. It is at this stage that it is said, Aham Brahma Ashmi, Tat Tom Asi. This is what we speak and say. And according to Advaita Vedanta, this state of Moksha is attained through Jnana Marga. What is Jnana Marga? 
Gyan Marga means to know the real nature of Brahma. Now, according to Ramanuja, the state of moksha is the state of charutya, sanidya, samipya, and sayutya. That I become close to God. I become in the live in the kingdom of God. I'm attached to God and so on. This is known as the state of a moksha according to Ramanuja philosophy. And this Ramanuja recommends Hakti Mark to attain the state of moksha. Or bhakti mark. And what is this bhakti mark? In bhakti mark, one has the faith in God. Second, one has the reverence towards God. And third, one has the feeling of full surrender towards God. This is the meaning of bhakti. Now, next comes Jainism. According to Jainism, the soul comes into the state of bondage when Pudgalaj accumulate in the soul. So, when we remove the Pudgalaj on the basis of Samhara and Nirjara, then one attains the state of moksha. This is what Janidam holds. Now, according to Buddhism, the state of moksha is a state free from pains and sufferings of life. And the state also in the state of highest bliss. This is what Buddha holds. Now, Buddhism recommends this tangic marga to attain moksha. Now, there are different interpretations of moksha. The one is positive interpretation, in which in the state of moksha we attain something which is positive. Negative interpretation of moksha holds that in the state of moksha we deny the pains and sufferings of life, negate the pains and sufferings of life. And that is third, the neutral interpretation of Moksha, in which neither we achieve some positive thing, nor we deny certain thing, rather we realize the conscious purus that is within us. Next comes the problem of evil. When one attempts to explain the world from a moral and religious point of view, then the problem of evil takes its origin. Evil refers to the painful state of mind and body. The problem of evil arises when one accepts God to be both good and omnipotent. If evil is the result of the God's desire, then God cannot be called good. And if evils are there in the world in spite of God's desire, then God cannot be called omnipotent. So, God cannot be both. God cannot be both good and omnipotent together. So, the problem of evil arises. This argue that evil is a means to attain the highest good. This is the argument of this. That in order to achieve something high, we have to 
pass through some evils. We have to pass through some which is not very pleasurable. So, and then again, this argue that every human being has been given the freedom of will by God. And he had the options to choose good or to choose bad. If someone chooses bad, then the consequences will be painful. So, it is man who is responsible for the evils in the world, not God. It is because of the misuse of freedom of will that a man suffers in one's life. So, we find that this is the way how the evil is explained. Some philosophers like Sankar holds that the evil is just an illusion. Because you all know that Sankar maintains this world to be an illusion, not a reality. So evils are there in the world, so evils are also illusions. And if evil is an illusion, it does not pose any problem to us. Then there are some thinkers like William James and Rastel. William James and Rastel, they argue that the problem ends as soon as we accept that God is either good or omnipotent, but not both. This sort of solution has been given, but definitely this solution will not be acceptable to theists. Now, Leibniz points out that the main cause of evil in the world is the imperfections which are inherent in finite things and beings of the world. So, it is not because of God's will that evil is there. Now, come religious knowledge, another important topic. Religious knowledge is related to the knowledge of God, soul, moksha, devotion, prayers and rituals. The source of religious knowledge age, book, or mysticism, or scent, or seers, or revelation, or region, and God. Religious knowledge is based on faith and belief. Religious knowledge is self-evident and hence does not need any rational justification. Religious knowledge is not formal because formal knowledge does not provide any new information. Whereas, faith hold that religious knowledge gives us a lot of information about God. Then, religious knowledge is not factual because religious knowledge is not based on experience, on facts, because we cannot take perceive God. Again, religious knowledge is not moral because we cannot pass moral judgments on God's actions. Now, religious ideas of every religion are contained in some religious books. So, how to understand these contents so far they say, it is said that religion played a vital role in religious knowledge. It is on the basis of reason that we interpret different verses, different statements which are contained in the religious books to understand 
the real nature of God. So religious ideas of every religion are contained in some religious books which can be interpreted on the basis of region. So region becomes important. But how can uh, we just make religion rational and comprehensible only on the basis of religion? Now, every religion contains superstitions and false beliefs. They become incomprehensible. Now, again, it is a region which removes these superstitions from religion. And this religion does on the basis of argument. The, the next is revelation. Revelation means disclosure on or unwilling. Revelation is a direct communication addressed to human being from a divine being through prophet. Through prophet. Now, divine revelation is a disclosure of some eternal truths through some extraordinary means of God to a rational being. Revelation is of two kinds, general and special. General revelation is that in which God reveals himself through his creation of this world and nature. And a special revelation is that where God directly reveals the nature, his nature to someone who is called the prophet. Now, <coughs> sorry. Faith is the most crucial and fundamental and signified tenet of religious life and behavior. Now, it is the core, faith is the core, the heart, and the center of religion. Faith happens to be both necessary and sufficient region and condition of religious life. So, you see, faith also becomes important. Faith implies a belief in the uniqueness, superior quality, and magnificence of the object of faith. The important feature of religious faith is commitment. We do have faith in God. Then we have to commit it to God what God said. We feel allegiance to the object of our faith. We feel responsible to obey the order of God. We try to be loyal and attached to it through our action. The important feature of religious faith is commitment, as we have seen. We feel allegiance to the object of our faith. We try to be loyal and attached to it in thought and action. Now, faith implies sacrifice. William James had beautifully defined belief as something we are prepared to act upon. This means that faith without action is like a tree without fruit. It is barren, it is sterile, and stagnant. Another feature of religious faith is that it is a source of inspiration. The most characteristic feature of religious faith undoubtedly implies a belief in the reality of the unseen or invisible, like God. Faith is not identified with belief. Religion, 
Because the word belief is used in two senses. Believe in, believe that. Believe that refers to a piece of knowledge. And believe in refers to the belief in some unseen reality. So, religious faith is used in the sense of belief in, not in the sense of belief that. Now, religious faith is different from superstitions. The latter is not rational. Superstitions are not rational. Whereas the former, the religious faith has some element of rationality. Yes, religious faith is uncertain. Its uncertainty is just because it is not based on our perception or on rational justification. Revelation is not based on faith. The whole process of revelation implies that the quality, the attribute, the truth of God are revealed to some human being who is called prophet and then prophet transfers those ideas to someone and that someone puts them in black and white in writing. So all this uh, implies uh, the process of uh, rationality. So we can say that revelation is not totally based on, uh, say, faith, rather it has uh, some rational element. We also find uh, the case of revelation in Hinduism, when we find in Mahabharata, Mahabharata, Lord Krishna showed his Virat rule. Look, Arjun, see where your relatives are lying. I think you remember. This is a shot of the revelation that Lord Krishna did to Arjuna. So, we find that it is this way that in unit seven we find that how different important topics and ideas have been discussed by different philosophers. With this, I'm going to close my present session. Thanks.